Good morning, class. For this session, I'm going to talk about introducing you to the wonderful world of endocrinology. So I'm Dr. Anna Angelica Makalalad Hosbe. I'm an endocrinologist, and it is my pleasure to you to introduce my subspecialty to you. So for today's session, at the end of this lecture, you guys should be able to, number one, demonstrate the approach to a patient with an endocrine disorder. And then you guys should also be able to recognize what the scope of endocrinology is. So when is the time to refer to an endocrinologist also? And also discuss the pathologic mechanisms of endocrine disease. Apply the principles of endocrine testing. It's unique to endocrinology. And explain and we'll briefly review the mechanisms of hormone action. So the first three objectives we will discuss in the part in the first part of the um, of this series lectures on the topic of the approach to um, endocrine diseases, and then we will discuss objective number four in part two and objective number five in part three. So endocrinology is not as popular as your cardiology or pulmonology because we don't have a this discrete um, region in the body, no. But it's actually uh, unlike cardiology, who has the heart and the blood vessels, or even neurology, who has the brain and the rest of the nervous system. In endocrinology, we have a unique focus on hormones and features a multidisciplinary approach to understanding hormones and their diseases. So sometimes endocrinology can have some overlap with other um, organs in the body. Let's say um, endocrinology can also be part of your GI tract, even in your nervous system or even in your um, muscles. No? So endocrinologists have a distinct um, organ, but instead we focus on hormones. So, horm um, endocrinology is the study of plants and hormones they produce. And just as a review of your physiology, you want to be able to differentiate between endocrine and exocrine. Both involve hormones, um, but um, it really depends on how the hormones are secreted from the gland. So, for example, in endocrine um, hormone secretion, the hormones are secreted from the glandular cells or from the um, source of origin of the hormones and secreted into the blood and then distributed to the rest of the body. In exocrine, the hormones are excreted from the gland to an alumen, usually that a lumen that opens into a duct. So an example of this would be your um, pancreatic um, pancreatic secretion no? in your exocrine pancreas or your salivary glands. No? You will have the secretion secreted into a lumen and into the ducts and to where its target um, um, target location should go to. Okay, so next, um, the scope of endocrinology classically involves the, well, the classic endocrine glands, uh, such as your hypothalamus, your pineal gland, your pituitary, your parathyroid gland, your thyroid gland, even your thymus, and the adrenal, pancreas, and the gonads, your ovary, and your testes, no? And this classic endocrine organs, communicate with other organs, either through hormones or even through your nervous system, through neuroendocrinology, and even cytokines, interleukins, and growth factors. But beyond the classic endocrine glands, the endocrinology is so much more. No? The endocrinology also involves the heart. No? There are also hormones being secreted there. The kidney. No, that's very crucial in um, bone and mineral metabolism and some other hormones such as your erythropoietin. 
Your adipose tissue is also one of the major conducting organs. The, the bone, we always forget that bone metabolism is part of endocrinology. No? Um, if we compare, what are the, we talked about earlier about exocrine versus endocrine signaling. And um, there are, aside from endocrine and exocrine, we also have um, paracrine signaling. So how do we differentiate between how um, cells communicate with each other? So how does your brain signal to your gut? Or let's say how your beta cell in your pancreas communicate to your alpha cell? No, they, they should have some form of communication with each other so that they can feedback also with one another. So in endocrine, no, you have in endocrine signaling, you have your source, the gland, no, it synthesizes your hormone. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it's secreted into the it's secreted into the uh, bloodstream and distributed, no, until it reaches the target cell. No? If it's not, sometimes it reaches the organ that targets to metabolize it or has no receptor for it. So it, it will only reach your target cell because of specificity. No? So there's a certain receptor in the target cell that is able to identify the hormone that has been secreted by the source gland. No? And it will depend on a number of factors, such as the number of receptors, downstream pathway, other ligands that can compete or that can facilitate receptor binding, um, as well as metabolism of the ligand receptor uh, on the target cell. And so, as you can see here, the source is usually far away from the target cell. But in paraffine signaling, usually the source is the adjacent cell, the source of the hormone, and the major determinant of the target. And then the target cell is just nearby or just beside or just adjacent to the origin of the hormone. And the, 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 the binding you know, will depend on the receptor and the receptor would um, confer some sort of specificity and sensitivity and will be affected by the diffusion barrier, determinant of the gradient from high to low. And um, it can be induced by inhibitory pathway, ligands, and binding proteins. And the distribution from the adjacent cell to the target cell, uh, from the source to the target cell, will also depend a lot on the diffusion matrix, you know, the area surrounding the, the source and the target cell. And the diffusion from the adjacent to the target cell will be affected by the distance between the two cells, binding proteins that can interfere between the diffusion, proteases that can uh, metabolize the target, the, the hormone being secreted. So um, I'd just like to emphasize here, you know, the difference between endocrine and paraffin signaling. So there are several pathologic mechanisms of endocrine disease. You know? It's very easy to remember. We have just four um, mechanisms. You know? We have your hormone excess, hormone deficiency, Hormone resistance, meaning you have a hormone, you have a target gland, but the target gland is not able to recognize your hormone. And lastly, the tumors of the endocrine glands could be non-functioning, meaning it doesn't produce um, excess hormone, nor does it confer deficiency. So let's see, you know, um, for hormone excess, as very usually these patients would have a distinct um, syndrome um, because of the the function of the hormone that is being produced excessively 
is exaggerated. No? So this is a classic picture of one of the first well-documented cases of uh, excess hormone secretion. What do you think this is? So you can see what do you notice from, so this is the before, uh, before picture of the patient. And after some time when he developed the disease, he now has transformed into something like this. So what do you notice? You will notice the hands, no? Very prominent. The hands are big. They look like sausages, no? And then uh, the, the lips is also changed, no? The front of the, there's also what we call frontal bo bossing. The, uh, the forehead has been more prominent. No, um, the jaw. That is my pointer. It's also more prominent. You have your macrognathia. No? Basically, a lot of morphologic changes that is um, character, character, characteristically seen among patients with acromegaly, where you have growth hormone hypersecretion. So when we go into pituitary, we will discuss more of this. This is another um, syndrome of hormone excess. Usually these patients, when they are um, full-blown syndromes already, you know, very uh, classic already, um, when once they enter the clinic or once you see them at the bedside, at the bedside, you automatically be able to recognize them because of the characteristic features. And what do you notice in this patient? Hmm? Well, the first thing you'd notice are this three abdominal striae, and it's not your usual abdominal striae, no? If you look at your bellies, no, you will have normally whitish abdominal striae or whitish stretch marks. But in this um, syndrome, you will have violations the reddish abdominal striae, no? And this man, aside from having the striae, will also have some sort of facial plethora. And as you can see, the face is very round, no? Very characteristic of moon fashy. The face looks like a moon. Uh, what else? Uh, probably some acne as well, no? So this are this is a very classic for Cushing syndrome, a syndrome of hypercortisolism. Next, we go to hormone deficiency. So this is a patient, no opposite. This is the before, during uh, the the when the patient still had hormone deficiency, and this was after treatment. What do you notice in this patient? So if you notice in this patient, this patient has some, some puffy eyelids, no? What else? Um, the affect is also, what do you say? Anyway, so mostly puffy eyelids and probably um, edema, sort of edematous in the face as well, no? But after treatment, so this is a patient with primary hypothyroidism. No? Before treatment and then after treatment, as you can see, some of the periorbital swelling has already um, subsided. So this is another um, constellation of sim symptoms of a patient with hormone deficiency. As you can see, then you have mucocutaneous uh, um, hyperpigmentation, uh, also hyperpigmentation here in these areas, in, in the palms, and then some patients who also have hypopigmentation or your vitiligo. No? And this is um, your classic Addison's disease or your primary adrenal insufficiency. So even without uh, doing any biochemical tests, you would already have an, uh, an idea of what the patient has just by looking at the 
the, the patient from head to toe and doing a very, very good history among your patients. And it will guide you on eventually doing your biochemical testing. So next we go to the third pathologic mechanism of endocrine disease, which is hormone resistance. And this is a, a picture of a daughter and the mother and what do you notice no you notice that um well for one the breasts are underdeveloped and you will have um, um obesity as well um and this is actually a syndrome called um albright hereditary osteodystrophy no, this is a syndrome where you have parathyroid hormone resistance. You have parathyroid hormone, but um, there is some defect in the signaling to the target cells, especially your, um, your bone that has receptors supposedly for your parathyroid hormone. So this is your Albright hereditary osteodystrophy. So next, the last pathologic mechanism of endocrine disease are your tumors of endocrine organs. So your tumors of endocrine organs can have some, um, can look like this, no? This is your craniopharyngioma that has affected the surrounding structure. And this is your um thyroid carcinoma no? this is a uh, a patient initially with just a benign looking goiter that eventually um enlarged to a full-blown anaplastic thyroid carcinoma necessitating insertion of that a tracheostomy tracheostomy is a um uh, and a conduit for an airway, you know, because probably the, the carcinoma has already infiltrated the, the upper airway of the patient. So this is your huge pituitary craniopharyngioma and this is your anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. So let's go deep into each of the different pathologic mechanisms. Now for hormone overproduction, no? This is associated with an increase in the total number of hormone-producing cells, therefore um, resulting in um, increase in hormone secretion. And this is another classic example, a well one of the first well-documented cases of this syndrome of hormone overproduction. And what do you notice in this patient? No, you will notice the presence of a number one, the most prominent is the thyroid stare. No? That's your exophthalmos. And you will also notice a goiter no? here in the neck. And this is actually very classic for Graves disease. Now, Graves disease is a syndrome where you have PSH receptor antibodies that activate PSH receptors on the thyroid cells, meaning there are antibodies in your body that attaches to the PSH receptor in your thyroid gland. No? And once it activates the PSH receptors, it results in the activation of the different um, pathways inside your thyroid cell, eventually leading to excess hormone thyroid secretion as well as increased production or increase um, expansion of the number of thyroid cells resulting in a goiter. No? Another example would be a growth hormone secreting pituitary adenoma. So this is what we call your Graves disease. Very classic for hormone overproduction. And when we go to thyroid, we will discuss the more distinct features of Graves disease. So what are the other causes of hormone excess aside from what I described earlier? It could be from um, neoplastic from a tumor. It could be from benign tumors such as pituitary adenomas, um, 
parathyroid adenomas, pheochromocytoma. No? You can also have malignant um, tumors that can cause hormone overproduction like adrenal cancer, medullary thyroid cancer. You can have ectopic tumors or even syndromes of multiple endocrine neoplasia, meaning you have multiple tumors in different endocrine glands in the body. No? And then you can also have autoimmune, just as, like, as I described to you earlier, the Graves disease. Another example will be iatrogenic, meaning something that is um, introduced outside of the body. Let's say um, you have excessive intake of steroid hormones or that can cause exogenous pushing syndrome or excessive injection of insulin you can produce hypoglycemia others would be infectious inflammatory or even activating receptor mutation so if there are mutations in your receptor that can cause um, activation of the receptor without even the ligand attaching to it no you can have some um, activating the receptor of these hormones. But these are very, very, very rare conditions. Next, with hormone underproduction, the most common would be iatrogenic. Um, either, let's say, the removal of a certain gland for some purpose. No? For example, um, you, your patient has a goiter or a thyroid nurse and it needs to under, and the patient had to undergo thyroidectomy, and during the thyroidectomy, some of the parathyroid glands are inadvertently removed. No, this can cause eventually hypocalcemia from the hypoparathyroidism. And also, aside from hypoparathyroidism, in the case that I just described, now is hypothyroidism if you remove the entire thyroid gland. So, these patients can have both hypothyroidism and hypoparathyroidism that can result in hormone underproduction of your thyroid hormones as well as your parathyroid hormone. And it can cause characteristic um, problems in the patient. Um, infiltrative, no, this is when the when your glands are overcome by iron deposition, let's say in hemochromocytosis, no? They're unable to function well, causing underproduction of your thyroid hormone. Tissue destruction, such as in an example would be TB adrenalitis, where your tuberculosis will destroy your adrenal gland. Therefore, your adrenal gland is unable to produce its um, adrenal hormones, no? causing adrenal insufficiency. Autoimmunity, no, very classic example will be type 1 meaning um, antibodies will destroy your alpha, uh, your beta cells, no, resulting in insulin deficiency. Hashimoto's is another example where autoantibodies can destroy your thyroid glands, resulting in eventually after all your preformed thyroid hormones are are consumed or released into the system, it will eventually, you know, towards the end result in hypothyroidism. So what do you notice in this patient? You know, in this patient, if you look closely, this is actually a male patient, but look at the penis of the patient. You know, that, that this patient has a micro penis. And if you look at the height, this patient is actually very tall. If you notice, uh, so this is just a 15-year-old. You notice the hands are very long, no? And uh, uh, you don't have any beard, no, in the face. This is already a 15-year-old guy. And some lack of chest hair and even lack of pubic hair or lack of characteristic male pattern um, hair. So this is actually a 15-year-old, 46XY with Kalman syndrome from central hypogonadism. No? So we'll talk about this when we go to pituitary. No? In Kalman syndrome, the 
the GNRH neurons are unable to migrate to its characteristic site in your pituitary, causing inability to produce your, sorry, unable to go to its place in the hypothalamus, no? And because of this, there's lack of GNRH. So if there's lack of GNRH, there's no nothing to stimulate your pituitary to produce your LH, your luteinizing hormone, and your uh, follicular, follic, follic, follicle stimulating hormone. So therefore, you will have um, lack of characteristic sex steroid hormones. Okay? So this is your Kalman syndrome, resulting in hypogonadism. What are the other causes of hormone underproduction? So we talked about autoimmune, it's your Hashimoto's um, and your type 1 DM. Iatrogenic um, could be from surgery or even radiation induced. No? If you irradiate a gland, it can cause, um, let's say your pituitary, then it can cause hypopituitarism. Could be infectious, hormone mutations, um, Enzyme defects, no? Very classic would be your congenital adrenal hyperplasia if you have a defective enzyme in the along the production of your hormone, let's say your um, adrenocortical hormones, no? You will have resulting deficiency in the different hormones, no? So let's say you have, uh, you lack 21 alpha hydroxylase deficiency, it can result in a uh, deficiency in your adrenal hormones. Developmental defects, no? I mentioned that earlier with Kalman syndrome, even vitamin, nutritional or vitamin deficiency, such as vitamin deficiency, iodine deficiency. Let's say you have iodine deficiency, very crucial in thyroid hormone synthesis, you will then have thyroid hormone underproduction. Hemorrhage, infarction, classic is your Sheehan syndrome or your pituitary infarction and even adrenal insufficiency. So those are your causes of some of the um, mechanisms resulting in hormone underproduction in its corresponding example. So this is in your Harrison's. So hormone resistance, no? So this... Oh, I already showed it there. If you look at this patient, you will see very clearly, phenotypically, this is a female. You have a well-developed breast. You have your hip, characteristic morphology of your hips, no? and even your face. No? This looks like a female patient. No? And even the, the configuration of your escutcheon, or your pubic hair pattern, no, but this patient had difficulty um, with, had some fertility issues and during workup, they actually discovered that this patient had a Y chromosome, which actually, she or he actually has a 46XY chromosome. And upon workup, they, they discovered that this patient actually had androgen insensitivity syndrome, meaning since the, the patient is able to produce antigen, but the androgens are not working on the target cells, therefore unable to affect its supposed effect, you know, which is your male phenotypic characteristic resulting in the patient turning into uh, phenotypically female um, patient. You know? So hormone resistance usually are caused by inherited variations plus physiologic stresses or even worsen signals from other organs. So a very, very, very common example will be your type 2 diabetes mellitus where you have, um, you're able to produce insulin, but the cells is not responding very well or has some form of hormone resistance to the insulin. Therefore, your insulin cannot act on your target cell, resulting in the characteristic um, hyperglycemia of these patients. Um, another example is when the target organ of the hormone is abnormal, meaning let's say in this patient you have androgens, but the target organ, the target cells, no, 
are unable to respond to it. No? Um, other variety of genetic order disorders, these are just nice to know. You don't have to remember them because these are very, very, very rare conditions. But it's nice to know that um, these are some of the mechanisms of hormone resistance. So it's not just all about deficiency, excess, but there's also such a thing as hormone resistance. Last is your tumors of your endocrine glands. So your tumors of endocrine glands can either be functioning, you know, the tumors are producing excessive hormones, but most often than not, tumors of the endocrine glands are non-functioning. So they don't secrete excessive hormones. But the problem with, this uh, with these tumors, if they become too big, they can have local compressive symptoms. No, such as in this case, no, you have a huge pituitary craniopharyngioma that can impinge on your um, in your optic optic tract, no, causing especially your optic chiasm that can cause visual field problems. It can cause um, it can impinge on your um, posterior and anterior pituitary causing some hormonal deficiencies let's say your diabetes insipidus no um although in itself the tumor is not secreting anything in excess but it can cause a lot of problems for your patient other examples would be your thyroid cancer usually so as i mentioned earlier this is anaplastic thyroid carcinoma but Although it's not producing excess thyroid hormones, <coughs> sorry for that, it has caused um, extension and invasion of the surrounding tissue, including the airways, um, resulting in airway compromise. That's why in this patient, they had to insert uh, tracheostomy in order to help the patient um, breathe. So that's the end of part one. So I hope you were able to understand some of the overall mechanisms of endocrine disease. So if you have any questions, just post them in our um, MS Teams or during our class discussion, just bring them up you know, or put them in the chat box and I'll be more than happy to answer your questions during our class discussion. So thank you and um, see you in part two.